Craig Elliott, along with Matt McNeil. We're in match play now. Well, now it's it's not so much about trying to beat the field, and it's it's more about trying to beat your opponent. The best of five head-to-head -head matches began nicely for Jason Belmonte, posting the front four to build a big early lead over Jesper Svensson. But after this split in the fifth, things changed. Every shot is so critical because at the end of the game, someone's going to win it or lose it. Svensson put up five in a row as Belmonte only struck twice more, putting Svensson ahead in the match, one game to none. It's all about throwing good shots. Belmonte resumed striking in the second game, giving Svensson little chance to keep up, leveling the match at one game apiece. The third game went back and forth for eight frames. Down to who uh, gets those corner pins to fall more often and hit those better shots. Svensson had the opportunity to shut out Belmonte with the back four strikes. Playing heads up against one of the best bowlers in the world, so I really need to um, to stay focused and throw good shots. If if I don't, I'm not going to have a chance. In, but it helped. Both players started game four with the first five strikes before Belmonte left a 10 pin in the sixth. It was this washout in the seventh, though, that pretty much decided the match. Svensson entered the 10th frame with a chance at perfection. Svensson advanced to face the winner of the Glenn Pedersen West Malott match, which also required four games. In the first game, Pedersen edged Malott in a low scoring battle, but Malott noticed something in the way Pedersen was playing the lanes. Glenn's, you know, a lot firmer, used some surface, and created a lot of hook to the right for me and let my arm swing loosen up. Malott used that to his own advantage and rattled off three big games, eliminating Pedersen from competition. The only clean sweep of the round belonged to top seed Tom Smallwood, who quickly got ahead two games to none over a struggling Matt Sanders. He's one of those guys that can start striking at any second, so uh, good shot, stay on top of him, and hopefully uh, another win here. Proper respect given and precautions taken, Smallwood rolled another clean game to advance to the round of eight. Smallwood's opponent looked early like it would be Adrian Ang, who got up two to nothing over Yanafan Larpafarat, but Larpafarat fought his way back to win three straight. In another match that looked like it would end early, Ryan Simonelli, a past winner of the Chameleon Championship, struck often and kept Liz Johnson at bay. Simonelli stepped up in the 10th frame of Game 2 looking to clinch the win and carry all the momentum into Game 3. Winner. Somehow, all the momentum became Johnson's, as Simonelli suddenly had difficulty putting anything together despite staying clean through all but one frame in the final three games. Johnson showcased her legendary consistency, rolling 247, 248, and 267 to erase the 2-0 deficit and advance. Five games against Ryan Simonelli. Got to get yourself kind of recomposed, ready for next round. What are you going to do with this very short break we have? I'm just going to, like I said, recompose myself and, uh, you know, just uh, try to go in with the same game plan and, and knowing I have to throw a lot of strikes and just make the best shots I can and hopefully come up, come up on top. DJ Archer started strong against Josh Blanchard, rolling 242 to take game one. Blanchard, though, wasn't phased. First game, a little bit of nerves and two bad shots out of the whole game, but um, feeling good rhythm now, so uh, should be good. Blanchard's comfort was evident in the second game, starting with the front six and finishing with 248. The third game became a practice game for Archer halfway through as Blanchard was striking and striking more and striking more. Three hundred. Yes, sir. Two open frames in the fourth game were the end for Archer as Blanchard stayed clean and moved on. In probably the strangest match of the round, Anthony Pepe and Zach Wilkins seemed to have trouble figuring out who should win. In the first game, Pepe was the first to see his opportunity as he filled the 10th with strikes, forcing Wilkins to strike twice. Just out the window. In the second game, roles were reversed and Wilkins filled the 10th. A washout by Pepe moved the match into game three in a tie. I'm just trying to really focus on being in the moment. Game three looked like it may be the turning point in the match, with Wilkins posting five strikes in a row in the middle of the game, but game four saw Wilkins strike only three times total. The deciding fifth game was more of the same, 
Ultimately, a missed single pin by Wilkins in the ninth and a clean game by Pepe was the difference. That was a real back and forth match and was fortunate enough to come out with a win. Pepe would get the winner of Francois Lavoie and Marshall Kent. The first game was close with Lavoie edging Kent by six pins, but the second game was an unabashed trouncing. Lavoie rolled 258 to Kent's 155, making it look to everyone, even Kent, that the match may be over. Yeah, there was a couple times where I said I'm, I'm done for it. The match isn't over until someone wins three times though, and the two traded strikes with each other into and through the tenth. Kent snagged the win and kept himself in the tournament. Kent again thought he was done when he left a 4-9 in the ninth of the fourth game, missing both pins. Lavoie had a chance to close out the match with a double. Enter an improbable game five. Neither player seized control until late in the game when Ken posted three consecutive strikes and moved into the quarterfinals. I uh, got some games under my feet, feeling pretty comfortable. Uh, I'm gonna come up with another game plan for the next match and see what happens. Different format now. Best of three, not best of five. Is it a different approach for the players, Matt? It is absolutely imperative that the bowler has to continue to adjust to the transitions uh, as the oil gets spread around the lane, as the, as the balls go down the lane. You just don't have that extra game to go fishing. Obviously, these are new patterns, so uh, I'm just going to have to use a little bit of uh, experience and, and knowledge that I have on the patterns so far. and try and do the best I can to, to set the lanes up and be able to strike as much as Jesper. Jesper Svensson started strong with the front six, two better than Wes Malat's front four, but Malat finished stronger. The two pin in the fifth for Malat was his only miss, taking the high scoring game one 279 to 258. What's the key to getting out of this in two straight? I just gotta stay patient and uh, take one shot at a time. I mean Jesper obviously, I mean he he got the pocket of her shot, so I don't foresee that going away either. Malat piled up the front eight. Svensson couldn't keep up, and Malat advanced to the finals. That's, dominant. That's going to lock yes, that one up. Dominant. I was able to, to make a last-minute surface adjustment there on the, the Storm Sherlock that I was throwing in that match and put a little bit more surface so I could stay a little firmer with it, and uh, all of a sudden I felt like I had the whole lane and I could stay aggressive. Liz Johnson and Josh Blanchard were close throughout game one until a missed 10 pin in the 10th for Blanchard meant Johnson only needed eight on her first ball to clinch the game. Game two was another close one that was again decided by an open frame. Johnson wouldn't let Blanchard recover from his 4-9 split in the sixth, moving Johnson into the televised finals of a PBA event for the third time. It feels pretty awesome, you know, my, my legs and my heart were beating out of my chest, so, um, you know, just made some really great shots and made uh, a couple good ball decisions, uh, throwing one ball in one lane, one ball in the other, and just making the shots. Tom Smallwood continued bowling like the number one seed he was, peppering Yana Fonlar Poffer out with strikes in the opening game. Arpafarat came back from a 2-0 deficit in round one and came up in the 10th frame of game two, needing a double to extend the match to a deciding third game. Nine spreader tie, strike to win and force a third and deciding game. Didn't look clean off his hand at all. Boy, wow. Luckily he came through today and, and made the show. After Anthony Pepe posted 2-0-2 in game one, Marshall Kent had a chance to take the game, but instead left this split. Kent picked up two to force a sudden death roll off. Pepe first. His strike was promptly matched by Kent. Pepe again. Kent to extend the roll off one more time. That was definitely a gift, and uh, you know, I, I, I pounced on that. After the roll-off victory, Pepe was unstoppable. Kent couldn't keep pace with Pepe's front nine, and Anthony Pepe would return to TV for the first time since 2014. I'm just so happy to be back on TV again. It's just, uh, it's been a long time, and uh, I feel like I put a lot of time and work into the game. Watch the final Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. 
Subscribe to the PBA YouTube channel and join us tomorrow for an inside look at Shark Championship qualifying.